Welcome to the Nature Photo Guys podcast, where we talk about nature photography from gear to our philosophies and everything in between. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back and relax. You're listening to Joe Dujardin and Chris Gibbs, the Nature Photo Guys. Well, hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're back for another episode of the Nature Photo Guys podcast. Uh, what have you been up to lately, Joe? Uh, well, I've been um, actually I've been out uh, shooting um, this uh, actually this past weekend. I had a really good slash interesting day. Okay. Uh, ended up hiking um, up to the uh, Kananaskis uh, Fire Lookout. Right. Nice. Um, but. What happened was um, I saw an elusive creature oh, along really? the way. Yeah. Mm, what could that be? A uh, gray wolf. A gray wolf. Wow. Yeah, you betcha. Nice. <laughs> now, well, um, let me guess, I did, you didn't get much time with it. None at all. I <laughs> uh, didn't get any photos, but it was really cool to see. Um, yeah. It was just one of those, you know, you start shaking kind of moments. Um, oh, and honestly, <laughs> I did not have camera gear with me. What? So you left for the, the house for this camera gear? first time, this, yeah, like I said, like 100%, it was just going to be like, just going to be hiking. Right. Okay. You know, I'm always bringing heavy crap with me. Right. Yes. Just, and this one was about 14 and a half K or something like that. And I just didn't oh, want yeah. to lug all this stuff up. Oh, right? Fair enough. Yeah. So sure enough. Yeah. Gray wolf. Okay. Grizzly. You're kidding. <laughs> no, grizzly. I had a rough grouse hen with five chicks. <laughs> oh, no. Well, that's bad timing to not bring yeah. your camera gear. <laughs> yeah, we had a golden uh, mantle squirrel up top. And uh, what was the last wow. thing? It was, oh, geez, what was it? Oh, golden eagle. Are you serious? Golden eagle at the top, uh, right at the lookout too. And I'm like, the day you don't bring a camera. Yeah. Right? It all happens, and it was cool. I, I got you. some 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 cool um, iPhone video of okay, the yep. um, of the the spruce or not the spruce, the rough grouse. Um, okay, yeah, uh, with their with their babies. Um, nice, but uh, yeah, that wolf was something else. That wow. wolf was something else. So that's amazing. Yeah, you don't uh, see that <clears throat> see uh, gray wolf very often. That's for sure. No, sometimes um, never. <laughs> yeah, now I seen like. I've seen them before. I've got photos of them before um, mm. in kind of that same area. Um, so, I mean, you know, they're, they're fairly elusive, especially with like, I mean, you're gone on a long weekend and it's busy and you know, that kind of stuff sure. too. Right. But yeah. Uh, yeah. it's um, it's so ingrained in my mind right now. Like it's one of those things I'll never forget. Right. So, yeah. but let me tell you like the direction it was going up and over, I was like, didn't even have my hiking boots on yet. So in my sandals. Wow. I'm just <laughs> oh, going up, wow. So you were extremely prepared. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? So <laughs> normally, you oh, know, we'd pull over at, um, you know, wherever, uh, just before we get into Canada, ask us, right. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. on our hiking boots, take out our camera gear, get everything ready. Right. You know, but didn't have hike or didn't have the camera gear. Right. So, so why would I even think otherwise. about putting my hiking yeah. boots on? Right. Oh, you know what enough. I mean? Yeah. yeah. That kind of stuff. Right. So here I am. I'm uh, I hate to say this, but I felt like a tourist because I'm <laughs> running up the thing. I'm in my flip flops. I'm in like, well, not flip, you but you know what I mean? I'm trying to get up the hill and stuff. Oh, but uh, anyways, wow. it was it was a cool experience. So that's um, just hilarious. You know, we, we talk about, <laughs> you know, in your workshops and all that. We always tell everybody to make sure they have their gear pull over, have yeah. it ready. I always have yeah. a camera on my, you know, my yeah. driver's seat. But no, mm -hmm. in those situations, hey, you know, yeah. at least you had the experience and you enjoyed well, it. Well, and we were in the moment, right? So. And that's it. Yeah. So I was, uh, it was good though. It was uh, nice. It was a good hike. It was hot. It was, you know, but still, you know, getting up there, I see upper and lower Kananaskis lakes from the oh. top down, you know. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, seeing the continental divide and, you know, nice. all this kind of stuff. So it was cool. But uh, nice. yeah, cool. so just kind of been trying to get some shooting in and the last little bit. Um, good. Yeah. You taught me some editing stuff. Um, right. Yeah. Um, video, video editing, video yes. editing stuff. Yeah. You betcha. And, um, I got stuck at, um, starting a project again. So hey, oh, we're good. good. <laughs> we'll have to have another <laughs> session. Will we? 
<laughs> well, I actually, I opened up Premiere and I got all my videos all laid out, right? And it's okay. nice that you can put the cursor over it and scroll, right? So, okay, that's sure. that video, that's that video, that's, you know what I mean? Right, okay, right. I'm going to use this one and stuff. And yeah. then I went under new project and then I was like, okay, no I think Chris from said here. to save it under the little house. You know, where it says Joe. And then I think we created some other folders. Oh, that's <laughs> it's funny. just like, but that's funny. Um, once I, I get that, that down, like you said, like yeah. um, a system. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think that the, uh, the rest of it, like just uh, dropping in the media and doing all like the cutting and all that would be fine. Right. You know? Yeah. But I, it was just trying to get that, that workflow, that all important yeah. workflow at the beginning. Sure. So I'm, I do it identical, the same every time. Yep. Right. Yep. And it's just, you know, it, it gets fluid. Um, I can um, uh, be more efficient. You know, you get more out because I just want to start creating some of these reels and stuff. Too, yeah, right? exactly. So. Yeah. I think, I think <laughs> e- even if we, did we set up some templates for you? I can't remember if we got to that stage um, yet, but um, I think might that have would sent probably some benefit. Up to the OneDrive a long time ago. Maybe, yeah. For yeah. some show of the, some of the shorts and stuff, but sure. Yeah. But I think yeah. some some uh, templates would benefit this scenario, and you can just drop, yeah. drop them into there and get That's used right. to the software anyway, right? So yeah, exactly. if, if you haven't used it, and and once you know using it every day or multiple times a week, you'll just get well. That's it. Yeah, it's just, just like, like anything, anything, right? So, yeah, yeah, oh, for, for sure. sure. So, um, so yeah, that's about it. What about you? I what's, uh, what's been happening since our, uh, our last episode uh, on the R5? I've been pretty busy on my, uh, <clears throat> business side of things. I was up, uh, in, in Edmonton way. So I decided, mm-hmm. uh, Hey, why not? Well, I'm up in Edmonton. Why don't I spend a day? And I headed to Jasper actually. So, oh yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so I kind of got in kind of late there and drove around a bit, saw an Eagle on Moline and, uh, you know, just drove around. There wasn't too much, yeah. too much wildlife, but it's, it's a crazy time of year there out in Jasper. There's way too many people. Um, oh, I hear you. You know, yeah. even early in the morning, it's just, there's cars everywhere. And of course, yeah, people not doing sure. speed limits and, uh, you know, but yeah. uh, that's okay. I drove around for a bit, stayed overnight and uh, camped in my truck again by myself. Nice. So that was kind right. of fun. So, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I headed back, um, headed back down 93 towards Banff and uh, mm-hmm. Canmore and just took it easy. And, uh, yeah. and you know, it's, it's hard sometimes going and making the drive knowing how how much gas is these days but oh, uh, i know right it's yeah. you just got to get that out of your mind i mean you if you don't go and don't get the shots um you yeah know, you're never going to leave the house if the if gas keeps going up right so well and that's i mean we're pushing what a buck 92 almost a liter yeah. or something like that yeah it's exactly. getting pretty ridiculous but I, i'm is, of the same sure. mind mindset I don't do much more than uh, really photography, you mm. know, camping yep. and that kind of stuff. So mm. um, that's how I justify it. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> as long as it works in your mind. Then <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. That's perfect, right? so. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah, you're up there. You're actually shooting um, uh, goaltending school, right? I was. Yeah, there was a goaltending yeah. school in Spruce Grove and uh, mm-hmm. shot some video there. So for a couple mm-hmm. days and yeah. So I, like I said, I just ended up deciding instead of heading back yeah. home, head to Jasper. <laughs> so yeah, it was nice. It was it was a right good few on. days. So, cool. Yeah. So, I guess uh, a couple of things here. Um, our our podcast is kind of moving in a, a bit of a different direction, right? Mm, uh, sure we're is. going to actually start uh, inviting guests. Um, I know traditionally that's what a podcast is, right? <laughs> for the most part, you know. <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah. uh, you and I were trying to uh, make it a little more um, uh, technical, educational. Sure more about the cameras and, and shooting and, and, and the yeah. gear and don't, we're not going to stop that. No, you know? we still will. Yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. A hundred percent. Um, yeah. especially when that uh, things go wrong or, or right. I mean, with, uh, <laughs> with our gear. Yes. Um, right but, and wrong. uh, but yeah, we're going to start inviting guests. So, yeah. so really you'll be seeing more content than normal, right? So that's right. That's yeah. right. Exactly. So we're excited tonight to be joined by one of Canada's premier professional wildlife and nature photographers with a career spanning two decades and images published worldwide. He's an associate fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers and a co-founder of the Exposed Wildlife Conservancy. His books with RMB include The Pipestone Wolves, The Rise and Fall of the Wolf Family, What Bears Teach Us, John also has four other coffee table books, including Banff and Lake Louise, Images of Banff National Park, Wildlife, the Canadian Rockies, A Glimpse at Life on the Wild Side, The Canadian Rockies, Banff, Jasper and Beyond, Tall Tales, Long Lenses, My Adventures in Photography, and The Kootenai Wolves, Five Years Following a Wild Wolf Pack. John prides himself on being a conservation photographer known for capturing wilderness scenes and wild, free roaming animals in their natural habitats. He currently lives in Canmore, Alberta with his wife, Jennifer, and his son, Porter. Welcome 
John E. Marriott. Hey, John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Joe and Chris, for having me on. Well, thanks for being here. Yeah, we're excited to have you on here. Um, we've talked about it for a while, and uh, you know, we just kind of uh, hooked up online while you were on your um, your your secret uh, trip. I guess we'll call. It. Well, well, we'll let everybody know what it's about, anyways. We're we're super stoked to have you on here, John. Uh, if you want to just yeah, let people know how you got started here, John. Uh, I know the story. I know a lot of us know the story, starting way back with Parks. But uh, if you want to let everybody know, that'd be great. Yeah, so I, I got my first camera when I was six years old, a little Kodak Instamatic. I went out and took photos of wildlife. I actually would build little blinds off in the bush. I grew up in Salmon Arm, British Columbia, in the Shushwap, and would build blinds. And I'd sit there and wait three days for the one mule deer to walk by and <laughs> get a photo nice. of it. It'd be a little speck off. And I actually still have the photo albums from uh, from back then, but nice. not a natural by any means. Uh, <laughs> then... Uh, Kind of, I still photograph sort of here and there um, through high school and stuff, but it wasn't really a focus. It wasn't until after university when I moved to Banff, got a job with Parks Canada, and all the people around me were really avid amateur photographers. Um, mm -hmm. I was working as a guide naturalist for Parks Canada, um, and so I just kind of fell right back into it. And I went and got my mom's old Pentax ME Super, and she had a Vivitar 200 to 400 millimeter lens. Oh, nice. Yeah. A big, huge, heavy metal thing. And I yeah. was taking it out around the parks. And, yeah. and I actually remember the moment where I started thinking I was getting good. Mm -hmm. And then my bubble was popped instantly. And I was <laughs> I was in the Parks Canada office on Banff Avenue, the, the big uh, tourism building there, Information Centre. Mm -hmm. downstairs in kind of the one of the back corners of the building and they had these big light tables and I had you know of course it was slides back yeah. then I had these slides laid out on the table and I'm admiring them and thinking how great I'm getting and stuff yeah and it's this big horn ram and I I turn around to one of the media guys and I say oh you got to come check out these photos you're really awesome and he comes over and he looks at them doesn't really say anything and he walks out of the room and he turns back and he goes yeah they're okay <laughs> yeah, and this was the it was the media guy or one of the media guys so i was like okay what the what does he mean they're okay like what? So yeah I ran out in the hallway and i got him and i brought him back and i was like what do you mean and yeah he started pointing out all these things and i'm like oh my gosh okay i got a long ways to go still <laughs> yeah so it was a it was a good sort of humble moment of uh, yeah oh for sure thought it might be getting good and then <laughs> took long yeah time. yeah <laughs> bit of a setback <laughs> yeah so during that right after i left parks canada i was there for five years 1992 to end of 1995. Um, and in 1996, I sold my first image to Canadian Geographic. And again, it was sort of a moment where I thought, oh man, I'm going to hit the big time instantly. You know, this is Canadian <laughs> Geo King calling. And yeah. Yeah. I, went, I opened a bank account and I got a trade name and I thought, okay, I'm, <laughs> here goes John, Jim Photography, John E. Marriott Photography. Yeah. Um, and uh, my first year, I made a grand total of $770. Actually, that wasn't what I made. That was my total revenue oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah so it, it actually took me a couple of years to even turn a profit and then yeah, a couple sure. of years to For finally sure. go full-time so now i'm i'm lucky now that i'm in my 22nd year oh that long hey, wow. wow oh yeah. that's awesome nice. good for you after that pentax uh what uh what was your gear after that what what brand did you uh uh, switch into or did you stay with Pentax? No, I, I ended up switching into Canon. Um, okay. My very first Canon camera was an A3, I think it was called. I'm trying to remember now. Canon, A, Canon AE2. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Uh, old film camera. And then I switched. Yeah. To, there was actually an R3 back then, which was my favorite oh. camera for a long, long time. But of course, it was not mirrorless. It was a slide camera. Of it course. wasn't even a digital SLR. Um, and it was actually quite similar to the 5Ds that many of us own fairly recently and many people yeah. still do. Um, so that same sort of look as even the R5 has nowadays. Mm. Um, so I got that and then I I slowly worked my way up to a couple different lenses. I started with an 80 to 200, then went to a 70 to 300. And then eventually I did a trip across Canada in 1996 in my VW van. I had this beautiful banana yellow VW van. Nice. It was just a beautiful thing. Awesome. It was the most money I'd ever spent on anything. Mm -hmm. And drove all the way across Canada and back and got back. And I was looking at all my photos and I just was not happy with the quality off mm -hmm. of the Pentax ME Super. And so, uh, and, and I had a, the Pentax ME Super and I had my first Canon at that time. Mm -hmm. And I thought I've got to invest in better lenses. And so I ended up selling that van and buying my first 500 millimeter telephoto. Oh, back then for Canon was a, 
It was 11 pounds and it was a 500 4.5. So it wasn't quite oh, as wow. wide open as it is now. It wasn't mm. even an F4, eh? Oh, oh no, it was a okay. big, yeah, big heavy yeah. thing. It was about this the weight of what the 600 was when it first yeah. came. Mm. Holy jeez. thing. Um, and then from that, I sort of worked my way up. In 2005, I switched to digital. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably different than many wildlife photographers in that I really loved the 5D line. And I did own some of the 1DX line, 1DX2s and 1 dx mm -hmm and stuff but i still always had 5ds as well and i actually at one point had a 72 for about five years too because of that crop factor yeah that's right so I did the same the, too. The, you know nowadays i'm mm -hmm. i'm now uh fully mirrorless i've got two r5s mm -hmm. and i got the opportunity uh just recently being a canon ambassador so back a couple of years ago i got signed by canon as their their second main ambassador in canada Paul nice. Ziska was the first. Okay. And Excellent. I got brought in as the second yeah. or third. I can't remember which it was. Yeah. And uh, so I get kind of dibs on early gear. I get to sometimes test stuff before it comes out. I got to test the R3 before it had even yeah. um, gone anywhere. And I couldn't even nice. open the files or anything. Oh, jeez. Um, which was oh, because really the, the software oh. wasn't updated. Right. Even the software yeah. couldn't <laughs> open them. So I had to yeah. shoot JPEGs to, to be oh, able to wow. see. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. But the, on this most recent trip, I went to Patagonia uh, just a, a week and a half ago to photograph pumas in That's Chile. That's right. That's right. And yeah. they gave me an R7 to go and test out and, and play with down there. Now, mm -hmm. the R7 testing has been done. So this was more, they just wanted to see what kind of images I could get with it and yeah. what okay. I thought of it. So for those of you that are wildlife photographers out there, check out what uh, Canon sent me to uh, play with while down here in Patagonia. What are your thoughts? Because we've seen the files online, John. We, we've seen them, all, you know, on social media, right? Yeah. And uh, they're stunning. Like the detail, the sharpness, yeah. everything. So yeah, give us the give us the lowdown on that that R7 because I know a lot of wildlife photographers are going to be interested, especially with that 1.6 crop on it. So yeah, I would say just right off the bat, mm -hmm. initial impressions. Um, almost all wildlife photographers are going to want to pick this up. Um, okay. Now. I am a Canon ambassador, so you can take yeah. it with a bit of grain of salt. That said, yeah, don't buy cameras that I don't use. Um, Fair enough. So, yeah. uh, you know, I'll be buying a 72. Um, I don't get them for free from Canon. I wish I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, it's when I first got it, uh, I actually still have it here. Um, it's quite amazing in how little and light it is. So it's about 20% lighter than the R5 is. Um, oh, okay. and, and a bit lighter even than the R6. Um, it's really small when you put it on the big 500. So right now I have a 500 F4. Mm -hmm. When you put it on there, it actually almost looks like a toy camera. Like it's so oh, small and little looking. Yeah. Um, now there's some advantages to that for travel. You know, mm -hmm. I was trying to stuff everything into an F-stop uh, Talopa and travel all the way down to Chile. I had 36 hours on the way down of travel, 32 on the way back. Oh, my goodness. Oh, and uh, it was nice to be able to, because I, I was originally going to go with a 1DX3. Oh, okay. And uh, then I ended up buying my second R5 about a month beforehand. But then even switching it up for one of the R7s um, mm -hmm. proved even lighter. You know, I saved even a bit more room and weight overall because yeah. I had to haul that backpack through all the different airports and all my connections and everything. So it's sure. nice to keep the weight on my back down a bit. Um, oh, so just as a, as a side note, because, you know, um, we use F-stop also. So that yeah, Lopa yeah. is is um, uh, checkable then? Like there's no problem getting totally. on, totally. on the okay. airplane? Okay. So if you yeah. can fill that bag up, you're good to go. You know, you're not yeah. going to have to check. Yeah, you just okay. got to make sure you only fill the ICU inside. You don't fill That's any right. side pockets, any of the back pocket. Don't yeah. fill the top pocket. Although I did, like I put a neck pillow and stuff like yeah. that in the top pocket. Yeah. Stuff that you can take out if you have to, if to yeah. squeeze it in somewhere. And, and you have an extra large ICU in there or just a large? Or I had an extra large you ICU did. in okay. there. Yes. Good but, to know. Because I know so I can I, fill, fill it, mine up it, and it gets it super heavy. <laughs> I had my 500 on my R5 with the converter. Um, oh, it fits. After, I had a R7 with the 100 to 500 on it. Mm -hmm. And then I had my 16 to 35 F4. Uh, a 1.4 converter and another extra um, uh, mirrorless uh, adapter just in case. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I wanted to use the wide angle at the same time as the 500 on the two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that fit in there. That all fit in there. And then, nice. Uh, as well, I had a neck pillow and it, mm. I mean, I was going from 
summer to pure winter. So I actually, when I went down there, I was super worried about them losing my luggage. So I included my big down jacket as well. Oh, oh serious? Took it out before shoving it in the, you know, the overheads. But, yeah. you know, with that Talopa, it's actually really easy to fit on Air Canada and WestJet. I even okay. did domestic flights with it already. Yep. Okay, good um, to know. Really easy to fit in there, fully mm. loaded up like that. It was super easy on Aero Mexico. I was I had a Delta flight, which was easy, and I had a Latam America flight, and mm -hmm. all of them were no problem. And the different size planes too. Yeah, so that was cool yeah. to see. It was a, I mean that new Talopa is just a, as you guys know is. Oh. Just, it's Amazing. right here. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's still brand new, and I'm just like you don't want to touch those, it. Uh, I, I still don't want to get it dirty yet, but I mean, I have to. I have the uh, the f-stop. Uh, what is it? The Ajna and the Lotus. But yeah, I'm yeah. constantly carrying a couple of bags and stuff. So with this Talopa, yeah. I'm going to be able to just put the the 500 and the R like just put yeah. it all in one, right? You know, it's so, amazing. Dad. But it's good yeah. to know that you can actually get on the airplanes without having to check any of that gear. So yeah. no, for sure. So John, you talked about. I'm curious about the, the r7 because you talked about it maybe being a little smaller like more of a toy is it still built well though it is still built well so it's got the same weather ceiling i had it out in well actually i had it out in both you know i wish i could say just falling snow but we also had one day of freezing rain that was oh terrible with like 60 kilometer an hour winds and rain blowing sideways and and i didn't take my proper rain gear down with me. I did for myself, but not for my yeah. camera gear. Cause I thought, oh, you know, it might just be wet snow or something. Yeah. Um, but it was a full on like rainy, windy, terrible day. And I, I was sort of draping a little plastic bag over the camera at times. Yeah. For the most part, it was just out in the elements all day long and it was totally fine. Um, okay, so cool. It's basically the same as the R5 and R6. Um, the one so the, the file quality from the R7, I was actually really, really surprised at just how good it is. Um, I, I don't, when I just flash them up on the screen and I'm looking through my Patagonia photos, I can't actually tell from pulling something up on my screen if it's R5 or R7, I have to go down and look at the wow. metadata to see. Oh, wow, okay. Um, even all the way up to ISO 2500. Once I get over ISO 2500, I started being able to, to tell that, oh, that's the R7, it's a bit more noisy. Okay. Uh, Interesting. But okay. even with Topaz, you know, being able to use Topaz to pull out some of the noise, mm -hmm. I was still getting usable images up to like ISO 5600, which is pretty good for a crop camera. No um, kidding. Was, there yeah. was a few images here and there where I wasn't able to salvage them. Sure, sure. That was, yeah, I, I was really impressed. And the 32 oh. megapixels, you've got lots of room to crop. Oh, that's um, so much. So that was, I mean, I'm just coming, I'm still shooting with the 1DX Mark II. And that's right, like 20, right? right? You know what I mean? Room to crop. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you still have room with that. Degree. So, yeah. yeah. So that that's um, insane. Um, that was nice. And then that 1.6 crop. I mean, I I actually went down there thinking I would throw the R7 on the 100 to 500, and then the R5 on the 500, and crop that way. Potentially mm -hmm. my teleconverter here and there. I yeah. actually never even used my teleconverter. I instead ended up shooting my 500 all the time with the R7. And getting in oh. for intimate portraits and things like that, yeah. Umas and Wanakos and everything yeah. else that we saw down there. Wanakos is a llama-like creature that. The yeah, I seen them on your stories. <laughs> there was like hundreds yeah. of them in the field or something, right? Yeah, yeah, they're they're like, yeah. a, like a llama type thing. They're related yeah. from that family. So, huh. so, um, so the majority of the shooting you did was with the R seven down there. Then I would say it's almost 50 50 because I oh, also really, shot eh? a lot with hundred to five hundred. Yeah, so it was okay. really nice to have that combo and be able to go. You know, I literally had an 800. Yeah. If I'd wanted to at any time and put a converter on it, had a thousand. I did do that a couple times, but really rarely. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thousand. Um, and then I always had the hundred to five hundred ready to go as well, hanging around yeah. my neck. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And and very croppable too, because I was shooting with the R5 on that. Yeah. Mm. So really, yeah. it was you know the only sort of downside of that <laughs> combo was when I got into really low light, mm -hmm. uh, I started to struggle a bit, and sometimes I had to just swap off the R5 onto the 500 and just shoot with that. Oh yeah. Okay. For the F4. Yeah. For the extra light. 10,000 range and stuff. Yeah, for sure. So, I, so I guess with the R5, you t technically can move it into a crop sensor mode, I guess, in 1.6, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I mean, you're, you know, what, you know, you're 45 megapixels with the R5. So, you know, you're still going to be have more megapixels at 1.6 with the R7 anyway, right. Totally. It'd be 32. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, so it was, I was, that's amazing. Just shocked at the overall image quality. You know, I, for and I guess I shouldn't have been because the 72 when it first came out, 
or even the 7D when it first came out were quite comparable, maybe not ISO wise, but quality wise to what you were getting out of the 5D series at the time. Um, and I think this is similar. You know, you're, you can compare the, the files quite nicely to our five files. They're, they're not quite as good, mm-hmm. but from a pro level, they're fantastic. And from an amateur level, I mean, there, there's almost no reason I wouldn't see people having this in their stable as the, the backup camera or even as the main wildlife camera and having something like an R6 as the backup. No, 100%. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. Uh, and really, in the end, you just got to uh, ask yourself, what, what are you going to use the images for? So right. a lot of the hobbyists and, and amateurs and, and you know, semi pros or whatever you want to call uh, anybody shooting out there, um, like, what are you going to do with those file sizes or, or the, the files themselves? So yeah. that R7 is going to be good for 99% of the population out there shooting, right? Yeah. You know, like and you're, uh, and the you're wildlife frames a second, which is great. Um, so yep. even uh, up to 30 on electronic, I didn't shoot it on electronic cause I just, there was nothing I wanted to capture at 30 frames a second. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's too much for most stuff. Might as well uh, shoot video. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. that's it. yeah. I did yeah. shoot video with the R7. It was nice and easy, um, easy to set up and easy to use. The, um, the one thing that's different with, there are two things that are different with the R7 that stood out to me. Mm-hmm. Um, number one is because of the smaller body size, they've changed the buttons on it. And you guys have probably read about this and anyone that's researched the R7 know that they've taken the um, autofocus point button, your little movement button for it. I can't remember the technical term for it. Like the little and joystick? Your, uh... Yeah, the little joystick. That's yeah. it. And your aperture dial and they've combined them inside the same area. So the joystick is now inside the aperture button and it's now moved up um, kind of by the viewfinder. And so that's weird. It was really tough to get used to. And I had particular problems operating it with gloves on. Mm. Um, And I could see that. Yeah. Kind of lucky that for the most part, the shooting was the same sort of a scene, you know, for instance, shooting pumas in snow. um, Mm -hmm. I was primarily, you know, plus two thirds or plus one. And I didn't have to adjust my aperture much. Yeah. Um, and then the other difference is when you're in the eye auto, the animal detection mode, yep. it actually applies across the board to all your different autofocus modes. So, you know, in the R5, how you can switch it on and off very quickly by just switching your autofocus modes. You can't right. do that on the R7. It, every mode you switch to is still keeps the autofocus eye, eye oh, detection on. So I oh. rigged mine really quickly to have a two button, just click, click to immediately turn it off. And just go to regular autofocus because, of course, if you had a Puma with two kittens, that's right. Focus wouldn't know which one it's supposed to be focusing on. Yes. So I had to have a quick way to turn it off. So yeah. I just went into custom controls and finagled that a bit. Yeah. Quick way to turn that off because otherwise, even when you switch from one mode to another, the auto eye autofocus is still on all the time. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I think it's similar to what Chris and I have set up because we have two two buttons set up at the back. One is for the animal eye detect, and the one's just your regular like spot focus, focus, yeah. focus yeah. dual back button focus, focus right? basically. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah. because a lot of times, like you said, I found actually with the uh, uh, the animal eye detect, um, a lot of times it would pick up on some of the larger uh, mammals, like um, it would pick up the nose or the ear, like something dark and black, right? So it would right. think it's the eye or something like that. So that's why we'd actually gone to that other mode too, because a lot of times, it, well, not a lot of times, but when it didn't lock on you were able to switch over fairly quickly, right? Yeah. Just by the yeah, press so of a button. This was basically one extra step. And I didn't, I didn't yeah. have a manual or anything with me. Um, yeah. I downloaded one to my phone right before getting to a place called Punta Arenas. And then uh, when we went off into the field, it didn't work on my phone. So I couldn't find oh, it. Oh, no. So, okay. Yeah. So, so I was kind of trying to fiddle without really knowing what I was doing in the custom controls and everything. Yeah. yeah you know, trying you to use some of the stuff I knew from the R5 and R6. So. Oh, yeah. for sure. I've heard that there are some people that w- that new joystick or whatever you'd call it now or whatever, but basically sometimes they're hitting the aperture as well. Did you ever yes, find you? I did that a bit were too. You? I, I, you just have to be careful with it. Oh, okay. And, like, especially I've got pretty big hands and mm-hmm. it, um, it was tough to like, there were times down there I was using heated gloves cause it was getting really cold. Yeah. And the, and so trying to operate the dials on it were not nearly as easy as it was with the R5, which I've sort of mastered now with big gloves. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, bigger dials, they're more mm-hmm. separated, easier mm-hmm. to figure out where they are and stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure why Canon moved around the, the buttons and the, like they've changed where the record button is now for video and things oh, like did, that. Oh, but okay. I really didn't find it that hard to adjust overall. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I was switching back and forth between the cameras constantly. Oh, okay, good. Um, so there was the, the, the odd time where I would do something, go, oh, shoot, I didn't mean to do that. Or <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so um, in our conversations on, on online there, John, you had said something about the buffer too. Yeah, so the buffer is smaller. I actually ended up, um, it's, um, I had the, the fastest card, SD card possible you could put in there. Uh, I think it was a 300, uh, 300 a second. Um, okay. Oh, three, yeah, 300 megabytes per second. Yeah, yep. that's the fastest to make right now. I might be wrong on that, but that's what I had in there. Uh, mm -hmm. So my buffer on that was only 36 shots. So it was just over two seconds. So I actually switched to C-RAW, um, mm. which bumped it up. Uh, and, and even with the C-RAW, I wasn't able to, you know, for the most part, I'm not shooting in really low light. So I wasn't too concerned about having compressed RAW files and losing too much data in there. Yeah. Um, and I do that with my R5 at times too, to increase the buffer size on it. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually shot the whole time in C raw. Okay. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with that or not, but uh, it raised my buffer up to about 60 shots. So I was getting about five seconds four four seconds oh, nice. um, at 15 frames a second, um, okay. which was plenty for, for this kind of thing. Um, but it is definitely something to be aware of mm -hmm. um, that the buffer is, <laughs> is, you know, there's a limit to it. It's not like a one DX series where you can just fire away or the R3 where you could fire away as long as you want pretty well. Sure. Yeah, no, exactly. And so there's no CF express card in there. There's just two SD cards in that right, one. Just two SD oh, okay. slots. So that was <sighs> that's definitely, nice. I mean, that's partly <laughs> what saves some of that room. Um, mm. it, it's a bit of a pain though, because then of course you got to take two different card readers with you. Yeah. Right. You gotta have an SD reader and you gotta have a CF reader or one that does both. CF Express, yeah, yeah, exactly. So just just question, uh, John. So um, uh, I'm the right to the both cards at the same time kind of guy with the dual slots. What do you do? Um, I I usually just do one or the other, but I had it set up so it was doing um, stills on one card and video on the other card. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So you're never kind of worried. By default, I didn't realize that until the first day. When oh, I got yeah, that. yeah. I what the heck? Yeah. There's stuff on this other card too. <laughs> I see. Okay. So there may be ways to increase the buffer size further by having mm -hmm. it automatically switch to that second card, which I didn't get into because I didn't have the manual and I didn't want to try and figure yeah. out going through yeah. the manual. I couldn't figure it out just just on yeah. its own. But I'm sure yeah. there's another way to increase the buffer size that way. So on the mm -hmm. uh, on the R5, you've got it video to the CF Express and then stills to the SD is, is how no, I do both up. on the CF Express and the R5, but R5, I don't usually run into too much buffer issue. Um, I've got that, that 512 gig uh, CF, CF card, Express, which has yeah. twi is twice the speed of the 256. Oh yeah, so, so you're not even recording? It's twice the speed. You're not even recording has... to the SD? What's that? You're no, not even I'm recording to the SD? On the R5. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because of the, the yeah, just because of the lag. Because I've run into that so many times. Because right. I'm still kind of like uh, the older, old school thinking where um, I used to record to one and have it flip over to the next to get all this, you know, this extra space. And then I used to, you know, I used to photograph weddings and portraits and stuff. And then so I started recording to both cards at the same time. Right. And then when they were full, I would remove them and two again. So I had backup in case one of my cards oh, yeah. failed because. I've got five cards I have s s taped to an external drive that also failed at one time too, right? Oh, so, it, oh yeah. So it's one of those reminders that- Knock on I, wood right now again. It, it, exactly. <laughs> and I would have thought doing your Puma trip, you know, for sure you would have, you know, uh, had some sort of like recorded to, to both cards, right? Um, yeah, but, no, I just did the, I just did the one card. So I'm always taking a risk, you know, you're- yep. Especially with a 512 gig card, but basically end of, yeah. you know, like, like I'm sure you guys do end of every day back right away, download back up twice. Yep. Oh, Clone. It's, yeah. Hard drives and it's even um, sometimes on trips, uh, you got a lull during the day. Oh it's yeah. Like yeah, on yeah. the laptop, the two yeah. external drives, yeah. the way you go. Again, just if you just know you got something it. good. Yeah. yeah always. Just, just to make sure you have something for sure. So, but no, I did notice that lag. Um, and that was primarily because of the SD card I was writing right. to at the same yeah. time. And it was frustrating this spring on a, on a few shoots. And I'm just like, oh, I know that's what it is. It just would not keep up. And then your buffer light starts flashing. Yeah, like, so I don't oh know if <laughs> with the, you know, so two ways to get around the buffer in the R5 and the R7 is mm -hmm. go to the C-RAW, try it out, see what you think of it. I've never yeah. been able to tell any difference. You can do lots of um, research online and there's lots of testing and stuff that's gone on. And mm -hmm. it's supposed, it's not lossless. So you do lose some data. Yeah. Yeah, even Canon themselves says it's, you know, it's it 
very, very minor. So even in low light conditions, you've noticed no difference whatsoever? No, no. Oh, I mean, you, you try not to underexpose something by more than, you know, yeah. three stops or whatever. They, well, they that if you get into two or, you know, three stops or more, you do start to notice it. Yeah. Sure. Well, and that's it. I mean, realistically, if you think of the, the subjects you're photographing for the most part, John, it's, it's, it's quite, the exposures are usually quite even across the sensor, like across the plane. I mean, you do have like that shots of that, that cougar in the background. Yeah. You know, winter scenes, you, you know, you're always exposing for the animal anyways, but uh, for the most part, I mean, with the way cameras are today, um, you know, it's really hard to uh, shoot three stops over or under like tried like getting a really yeah. bad exposure yeah. you, you know because you see it right through the viewfinder that, and that's it right so uh shooting that sea raw which i wasn't even aware of john thanks for that i'm gonna take a look oh, at yeah. that and, and see yeah. um you know might be the way to go uh, might be the way to go for um for that buffer problem and too. then the other the other one is um <clears throat> going you know and i didn't know this actually to one of my photo tour clients pointed it out at, at, at one point uh, recently but uh the 512 gig card of the CF Express, even though it's an extremely costly card, mm -hmm. is actually two 256s put in there. So it writes twice as fast to it because it just switches back and forth between the two little 256s in there. What? And, uh, and so you get twice the buffer out of it. Oh, Joe's <laughs> taking notes. <laughs> well, no, John just costing me money right yeah, now. He totally is. is. <laughs> he totally <laughs> is. <laughs> oh, too funny. But now I'm actually, when I shoot C-Raw and I shoot with the big card, I actually hardly ever run into buffer issues anymore. Whereas uh, when I first got the perfect. R5, I was constantly running into buffer issues. Well, and that's Jeez. it, eh? Okay, no, that's a great tip. I'm sure yeah. everybody's going to enjoy that one for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I should point out to everybody too for those, those people that are listening that aren't watching this on YouTube. Um, you mentioned that I had a cougar behind me that's on my, <coughs> my uh, <laughs> profile. I do not actually have a cougar in the room, behind yeah, me. that's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's that zoom drop backdrop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so, good thing you clarified that. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, in the end, you would recommend that recommend the, the 70 because right now, John, so I've got the R, I shoot the 1DX, the Mark II, and uh, the R5. I'm looking for a backup. I'm going to get sell off my 1D, right? Um, yep. So in your opinion, as far as wildlife photography goes, would you say an R6 or an R7 as a backup? I'd say an R7. Yeah. Just skip the R6 altogether and go. Because I was going to pick up an R6 after I watched your other presentation you had. It might have been through the camera store or Canon or something. And you're talking about the R6. And I'm thinking, oh, that's great. I might go with an R6 as opposed to two R5s, right? And then now that I hear about this, this, um, this R7, um, it might just make sense to get the, uh, the R7. Yeah, I'd say so. The only, you know, the only caveat to it is if you do a lot of low light shooting, which most wildlife photographers do a bit, but it's not, you know, it's not really the burn and butter and super low light. Um, yeah. And then you'd lean towards the R6. Um, because I see, it okay. is such a great low light performance kit. You know, I've, right. I shot the R6. I, I remember looking at, ISO 12,800 files and mm -hmm. I, I barely even have to run this through Topaz. Like this is yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there is that difference. The R6 is exactly the same as the R5. I mean, it's a mini me. It's all the dials are the same. All the, oh, okay. the same. Okay. It looks the same. Okay. It is the same, except for like a couple of minor things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, video is not quite as high quality, yeah. mm -hmm. but way high enough for vast majority of us, myself included. Oh, um, the R7 100%. to me, that the, the the extra feature though is having that, you know, for it's going to be my third camera, mm -hmm. and then some trips I'll take it on, and some trips I won't. So yeah, if I'm going in my car, I'll have all three lenses or all three cameras uh, mm -hmm. along with my full suite of lenses because I can carry it all with me. Mm -hmm. If I'm going on a trip, then I'll be deciding between bring the extra R5 or bring the R7, and I'll give you guys an example. So when I go do muskox uh, at the start of September in Nunavik. I'll be taking the R7 because that extra reach will be really handy. Mm. And, and I've got yeah. plenty of light. It's out in the open barren lands. It's in the That's tundra. right. If I go to Spirit Bears, uh, which will be the week after the muskox, mm -hmm. I will instead take my two R5s because there I'm going to need that extra light in the rainforest. And I don't usually need the extra reach. In fact, with Spirit Bears, oftentimes they're walking, you know, 
three feet away from you. You can't even photograph. Well, I heard like you're using like a 70 to 200 or something. Oh, it's crazy. Like, you know, oh, wow. it's that, they're that close, right? Like, yeah. or yeah. you you can get the, 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 the images you need with just that short zoom. Yeah. The, the Creek that we often sit on the one we go up to, to look for the spirit bears is, you know, in, in most days is only like 20 feet across. Oh, geez. Wow. On one side, and the, the bears walk right up the middle. Yeah, yeah. It's not far away. From them. Wow, that's insane. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So I can see what you. I can see what you're saying, though. I mean, all the 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 the, uh, the cameras have um, a certain place, certain time, you know, certain situations. R right. five though can handle it all. The R six. Uh, it's half the sensor size, but pretty much can can handle it all the same. Yeah. You know, like you said, mini version, and that's seventy. Um, yeah, that one point six. Um, yeah. still a high frame rate and everything else, but it's just because I I looked at it and um, yeah, it looks like it's a little like you know no bigger than your cell phone, <laughs> like an iPhone <laughs> it's, Max it's or something. Not a big <laughs> camera, and it's it's particularly so, short on the right hand side. Oh, uh, okay. Is this side when you're looking at me on. On yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Weird. So okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, John. Um, I've I think I've heard that the video is actually better on the R7 than the R6. Is that correct? Uh, that I don't know. Uh, well, something to look into anyway. Yeah, I, I did do video with the R7 though, and it's superb. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. time, yeah. And I did not do much video when I tested the R6. I only had the R6 for two days. Oh, okay. 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 Well, cool. when you have the R5, there's no point in using the R6 <laughs> yeah, for video. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so I have another question for you, John, because I'm st still the same with you, and and Chris is the same. We all have all our our EF glass, like the the 500, the one to 400, the 16, 35, 24, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, what are your thoughts on that one to 500 though? Because when I seen the aperture range. Yeah. Up to seven point one, I started going. E, yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, so, so I um, still have my hundred to four hundred EF. I'm yeah. the hundred to five hundred right now. Canon's loaning it to me. Okay, uh, with the R seven. Yeah. Um, so I've used it three different times now for different time periods, mm -hmm. and I love it. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't love the like. I don't think you're getting enough of an overall image quality bump. Um, to justify necessarily, if you've it's pretty good, you've got the second version of the hundred to four hundred. Yeah. If oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. If you really wanted that extra hundred millimeters, or anyone that's coming to it from an older hundred to four hundred, or from a seventy mm -hmm. to two hundred, or anything else um, yeah. in the EF line, or or the Sigma or Tamron line, where you wanted to be a better quality lens, oh, yeah, then I would get that hundred five hundred. But yeah. I'm still at the hundred to four hundred EF, waiting for whatever the next iteration is going to be of 100 to 500 or of a okay. 400 yeah. or whatever they're going to be making. Next. Okay. Yeah. Well, cause Chris and I can, I uh, can attest like that one, the 400 on year five, um, yeah. even for video, eh, Chris, oh, like yeah. that's our go-to lens. Yeah. It's every just, day. Oh, yeah. tax chart. Well, it's a, it's been an amazing lens since the beginning, but yeah. uh, coupled with the yeah, R5. I did enjoy with the Pumas being able to just zoom in that little extra bit all the mm -hmm. time. And yeah. Most of the time I had pretty good light, but yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, the 7.1 is not ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what Canon comes out with in the future here. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Cause I, <laughs> yeah, I was kind of on, on the fence with that lens too, but I thought, you know, all my EF glass is, is great. It's done the job for all these years and being able to couple it with no loss of light or, you know, image quality or whatever people thought might've happened uh, was, uh, just made no sense to um, uh, to switch over, you know, yeah, right I now think, anyways. So I, I think there are certain, like I did switch my 70 to 200. Um, oh, you it, did? Yeah, I did because it's smaller. It's light, and I, I do think there's an image quality difference there. Mm. So I have oh. the RF 70 to 200. Oh, great. Okay. It's tiny. It's just a, it's a thing of beauty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the only thing I don't like about it is you can't put the, the uh, teleconverter on it. Um, oh. For some reason. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's some limitations with the 100 to 500 with the teleconverter too, isn't there? Yeah, there, there is. Yeah, there are. Yeah, it only shoots from the three to 500 range. Although, right. if you're putting the teleconverter yeah. on, you're, you know, yeah, you're probably shooting it at the high. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Just take so, it off if you. I have, yeah. I have quite a few um, clients that show up with the 100 to 500, and they just love it. Mm -hmm. But I, I do still think if you got the 100 to 400 to hold out and see yeah. what's, what's coming down, you know, yeah. as long as your image quality is still great with it with the R5. And oh. R7, 
crazy. And I do so much video. I have the variable mm-hmm. neutral density adapter, right? So yeah. it's just handy with the EF lenses. So you can just put any it's lens so on and have the adapter. So, yeah. 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 No, that's, that's cool. So what, what is your go-to lens though, John? What is the one lens that is it still your 500 or is it just, I, uh, I use a little bit of everything now. I would say still the 500. 500, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just, I mean, it depends a little bit where I am. Like, uh, I know with muskox coming up that mm-hmm. uh, there'll be a lot of, you know, sort of placing the animal into the landscape because the yep. sure. air in landscape looks pretty cool. Oh, for sure. Maybe fall colors and everything. Yeah. Um, but I still love the, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. still like a portrait guy. You know, if you go and look on my website or stuff, you know, it's it's mostly animals looking at me. Yeah. Yeah takes forever to get them to look at me yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so i know it's just instant but uh, i know yeah I, I like the emotional connection of that mm-hmm. sure um, mm-hmm. so i'm always a 500 and i often throw converters on and honestly john uh the quality of the canon glass i have the 500 uh, f4 version 2 yeah. and the 1.4 version 3 and the two times version 3 right um, that one, the four stays on that 500 almost all the time. That's yeah, fantastic. Uh, and, and the, the, the loss of quality is, is almost nil. Like yeah. when you're looking at the files, right. So, yeah. uh, that's how good, uh, the version three converters are. Right. So, um, so, but yeah, I'm the same. I, I like the, the long, the prime lenses that kind of, yeah. it gives you a certain look to you. Like <laughs> people does, just know, yeah. <laughs> you don't spend that kind of money for a 500 mil reach. You spend that kind of money for you know the the extra stops of light and the look of a prime, right? You know yeah. those nice clean yeah. backgrounds and everything else too, right? So yeah, but uh, that was one of our questions we had to ask you because <laughs> you know everybody has the one of their favorite lens. lenses, right? <laughs> uh, the go-to lens, right? So yeah, which kind of segues into something else, right, Chris? Um, your favorite subject to photograph because. I mean, to uh, it's obviously predators. I mean, that's a kind of a broad term, but it's obviously predators. And I'm thinking it's like the wolves, the pumas, or the wolves, the cougars, and, and the bears. But if there was only one, I'm guessing it's wolves. But if there was only one, John, <laughs> which would it be? <laughs> that would be tough, you know, because I when it I is, started eh? my career, it was all bears. Mm-hmm. And then for a good decade and more, it was all wolves. And now that I'm working on these various cougar projects, yeah, it's be pretty tough to give up cats. But I'd probably say it's, wolves overall. It's it's overall. changed over the years, but it it depends on where your focus is at the time, right? right. I mean, besides that, I mean, other other than that, those top three, I mean, that kind of covers the the apex predators of North America, anyways. I yeah. mean. Unless you start all traveling all over. all over the world there, John, looking for something else, but uh, <laughs> get, getting into the the jaguars and the leopards and all those kind of, all the other cats. But uh, no, we were kind of debating that, Chris and I, and we kind of thought it would be uh, <laughs> the wolves we based on the books be. too, right? So, yeah. yeah. And the amount of time you spent, like even uh, your current book, uh, the, the Kootenai Wolves, um, you, you know, five years in the wild, right? Yeah um following following that pack like i mean just the dedication there concentrating on one subject you know for, for that length of time i you know that that's a that's another good point here um bringing that up because you know we get the question a lot uh, as far as like how much time you know people assume that you just go out and you take a picture and then you come back home and you post it on social media <laughs> so you know i mean if you i'm sure talk he sees about, wolves every day like oh no, and that's, yeah. that's exactly it right you know so maybe maybe just touch on that really quick there john if you don't mind i mean sure. like the, the amount of of time and dedication it takes i mean you know um like five years just for that one project, right? Yeah, I mean that that was that was the Kootenai Wolves, which were a, a pack that I sort of stumbled upon thanks to a friend pointing them out to me mm-hmm. back in August 2012, mm-hmm. and I followed them up until 2017. Um, and it it was a project unlike any that I'd done up to that point um, because I didn't have any help whatsoever. My previous wolf projects. Had there been, you know, a researcher or a, a biologist or an, an expert, sort of at the core of it, and and helping me along and helping me find them or saying, you know, this is where they were yesterday or that kind of That's thing. That's right. Yeah, for a sure. Tremendous amount of help. Plus, the you know the pack I'd followed previous to the Kootenai Walls was in Banff National Park, so there were lots of other photographers too that I could glean information off of. When I went yeah, down sure. to Kootenai, I immediately realized I was on my own, which I loved. Mm. It was super cool, but. 
everything I had to discover was completely on my own. Parks Canada didn't know. Um, you know, the biologists oh. I chatted to didn't know. They wow. were coming to me for the information. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. So, so it was, it was uh, like, I absolutely loved it because of that. And I had to go in and put in the groundwork, figuring out where all the different rendezvous sites were. It took me four years to figure out where the den site was. So it was my fifth and final year. I finally found no, you're kidding. Wow. it. And, you know, speaking of uh, using crop cameras and so on, I photographed most of my shots at the den site that you see in the book. Um, Canon loaned me an 800 millimeter lens. I put a 1.4 converter on it and I shot it with a 7D2. Oh, oh wow. 1.6 crop on the 800 with the 1.4 converter. And then I cropped yeah. some of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. So even further, you know, it's like going. Wow. Yeah. And again, you know, that's good for the audience to know because everybody assumes you're right in their face. Like, yeah, no, man, it literally couldn't be like it's against Parks Canada guidelines to be within 200 meters of a den site. Mm. So of I had a den site, really careful that's... where I was observing from. I had to make sure. I mean. You know, you think of you spent all these years and finally figured out where the den site is. The last thing I want to do is have the wolves discover me and move dens. Yeah, that's which, right. If yeah. you disturb them. Mm -hmm. So I had to be so careful and plan out and scheme my route in there and figure out where can I view from where they're not going to discover me, where I can actually get multiple days in of observation and photography. Yeah. Um, so it was <sighs> wow. super challenging. I loved it. And I was going no kidding. In, lamp in the pitch black. Yeah. In the pitch black at the end of the day. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. This was June. So, you know, the days are, oh. I was <laughs> leaving my house at two 30 in the morning and oh, I was getting goodness. home at one in the morning. That's right. Wow. That's right. That's yeah. Crazy. Those 14 hour days are killer, right? 15 hour days of light is what it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, and then I, I had to do drive that. to get down there and yeah. but it, was, uh, it was totally worth it. It was, um, you know, for me, Apex predators have always been this huge draw on me, you know, kind of mm -hmm. the, the danger involved, the risk mm -hmm. involved. But mm -hmm. to me, it's a lot of also that misconception that there is so much danger and risk because there really isn't. These animals are extremely tolerant of us in general. You know, yeah. We make all these mistakes and yet they still allow us to, to coexist with them. Um, oh, 100 Their world with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I've always wanted to kind of get the message out. And it's from my old Parks Canada days, I think, of you know, telling a story with my photos and getting these books out there that people can enjoy and get inspired by. And I've always kind of thought, you know, even now that I've started a wildlife conservancy uh, with Kim Odland, who's my my co-founder and that a fellow from Edmonton, um, and we're, we're doing, you know, trying to get all this good work done in conservation. But I've always kind of thought it's probably not going to be me that ends up being the one that makes a big difference. But if I can be some tiny little part of inspiring some kid out there or oh. somebody out there that's the one that goes and makes some crazy legislative change down the road or yeah you know is the one that spearheads protecting some huge chunk of habitat down the line then it'll all be worth it to me uh absolutely you know, having gone down this road and and doing the apex predator thing and doing the conservation thing and everything well, can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, Conservancy, like uh, when it started, um, you know, um, yeah, the history of it, that sort of thing? Yeah, so the Conservancy started as a, a YouTube web series called Exposed with Johnny Marriott. You can still mm -hmm. go find all the episodes on there. Mm -hmm. And they range yeah, oh, yeah, from yeah. going on adventure with me to the Great Bear Rainforest to ones that are very mm -hmm. conservation oriented, trying to stop the grizzly bear hunt in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Um, which we were successful in. We were played a, a role in that in 2017. They outlawed grizzly bear hunting in British Columbia. So that was super cool to have a tangible goal achieved. That's right. Yeah, um, for sure. In uh, the Conservancy itself, though, started uh, in March 2020. Um, and we concentrate on apex predators. We're trying to give that wildlife a voice, in particular, our cougars, uh, wolves, wolverines, grizzly bears, sort of the big top of the food chain animals. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of working in a couple of different angles. One, we want to help protect habitat, corridors, um, space like that. But then also we want to really address some of the uh, misconceptions that are out there about, you know, the, the importance of these animals to our ecosystems, just how critical and key they are. And then finally, we also want to just address some of the injustices that are done to them. So, you know, as an example, I mentioned this in the Kootenai Wolves book, um, but those Kootenai wolves, as soon as they step outside of the national park, which they spend almost 50% of their time outside the park for nine and a half months a year, they can be shot, legally mm -hmm. shot, uh, hunted. 
for 12 months of the year in the valley bottoms, they can be trapped. Um, really? There's no limit on how many that can be trapped. There's a limit of three on how many can be hunted. So you can have two hunters together can wipe out six in one go. But one trapper can wipe out two whole packs, three whole packs, whatever he can get. And there's no limit. Oh, and they can do sad. it year round in the valley bottoms in the Kootenays there, um, which is just wow. insane. You know, there's just so little regulation around it. And it's all dating back to, you know, literally early 1900s to when mm -hmm. they're trying to protect the game species. And just mm -hmm. nobody's ever changed it. So we want to get in and and get some of that stuff changed. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're right now, our big project is we're making a, a trapping documentary called Trapped in the Past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've seen that. To address uh, yeah. a lot of these regulations and just open people's eyes to what's really going on out there in the in the wilds. You know, these weekend warriors, these basically a bunch of old white guys that are out there for fun, trapping and killing stuff and with very little regulation on them. And, and I don't, you know, we, we go out of our way not to blame the trapper. It's the mm -hmm. industry and the lack of regulation around it that is the problem. Sure. Um, okay. That's what we want to address and tackle moving forward. Okay, cool. Well, no, that's wow. that's great, John. Thanks for that. So um, we're going to have links to everything um, at the bottom of the uh, uh, the, um, the the channel there, uh, John, uh, explaining them uh, where they can find, well, links to everything. A anyways, right, hey, Chris? Uh, yep. Conservancy uh, and the new book, everything, you betcha. Yeah, so, for yep. sure. So no, that's, that's good. I'm glad you explained that there, John. So uh, what do you wish uh, you would have known back when you first started out uh, that you know now, like for your, your photography career? I think, you know, probably the most useful thing to me would have been a broader knowledge of animal behavior and animal biology. Oh, and, excellent. Yes. You know, yeah. it's something I think a lot of people, they get interested in wildlife photography and they go into it because they like the photography aspect. They like finding mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. um, but they don't necessarily know anything about the behavior. And I didn't either at the start. I made some That's right. horrendous mistakes early in my yep. career. Um, I remember one in particular, and I, you may have heard me tell this before, but I'll, I'll say it again. It was very early on. I, I had not never sold an image at this point. I was a total amateur and was working for Parks Canada, and I found out about a, a cougar kill at the end of Vermilion Lakes inside Banff National Park. Oh, and okay. I hiked yeah. out there. I drove down to the end of Vermilion Lakes Road, and I hiked out there, and I was all excited, and you know, didn't have any bear spray, didn't have anything but my big lens that I just bought, the big new 500 lens. Mm -hmm. band <laughs> to get it. And I was all excited to go use it. And I got out there, and... <laughs> I couldn't find the kill at first. And when I did, I was right within view of the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, there was kind of a field and the cougar was bedded down in this field and it was the, the kill was kind of behind a rock. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting out in the middle of this field with my tripod set up in this big, huge lens. And of course, people started stopping on the highway. Like, oh, what's, no. going on? what's going on? Oh, no. I was totally ignoring all of it. It was before the highway was fenced. So people yeah. were just walking down oh, and all no. of a sudden, I hear this voice that I recognize, and it was my buddy, Karsten Hewer, who many of you may have known. He's a, a Parks Canada Award, and he's now in charge of the Bison Project. He wrote all kinds of cool books about conservation and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Karsten was, the first thing he said to me is, I turned around, and I said, oh, hey, Karsten. He's like, what the F are you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> and I look around, and there's like 20 people around me, and I'm like, oh. No, oh, she is right beside the Trans Canada Highway. Like, I don't care if you want to get a photo and yeah, so yeah, eye opener for me. Like, you know, just not only an animal behavior thing, but my own behavior. I'm that's like, right. Yeah, that's sure. right. I got to watch when you're out there. And, and uh, yeah, so I think going back early in my career, and I think people starting out now, immerse yourself, watch documentaries, mm -hmm. read books. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's some amazing uh, cougar and wolf anthologies. I'm just looking at my little book library over here and. And I've got all these books that are about behavior and science and yep. mm. reading all this. Some of it's quite dry, but I just soak it all up and get as mm -hmm. much information as possible. So, you know, when I'm out there and I'm trying to find a wolf den, for instance, A, I have some clue what I'm looking for. B, That's right. I know what I should be doing when I do find one, what I should be doing, what I should not be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so to not disturb it and stuff. And so I think all that stuff would be really helpful to people starting out. It would have been helpful to me to kind of have known more. Yeah. I, did, I did have a degree in wildlife management, but it still mm -hmm. doesn't really prepare you. You know, I, I would have picked more people's brains and mm -hmm. oh, sure. uh, I think early on, if it had existed, I would have gone on a couple of photo tours. You know, I, I just saw Joe, you're advertising your Waterton one in September. Yeah, I, I yeah would for sure. Highly recommend people go out and do stuff like that. 
because when you're actually out in the field with someone like Joe or me or whoever, that, that's a bit more of an expert, you, you can pick up on the behavioral stuff that we tell you, you know, even if it's just a big horn ram, you know, just a big horn ram. Yeah. You know, we can say, oh, you know, it's getting annoyed with you right now. That's you know, right. Because right. it might want to access that little water spot. Yeah. Or, you know, little things that people don't really think of when they first get into photography. Well, so, I think people I actually are really starting to love that kind of stuff. Like they, they mm -hmm. really are. Like, I mean, uh, we're going to be photographing the elk rut down in Waterton. And I specifically posted a photo of uh, two cow elk up on their hind legs, yeah. you know, fighting each other, jostling, that kind of stuff to show that specific behavior. Cause people don't realize that, that the cows will actually, um, you know, fight each other. Um, and it's not just the big bulls, you know, yeah. uh, fighting for the right to mate too, or mm -hmm. for the hair or more to, to, you know, to bring more of the cows in and stuff. Right. So, um, I, I think right now too, there's, there's a big shift to, um, trying to capture, um, more natural like behavior. So, you know, when, I think when people first start out, they get a picture. Okay. That's a picture of a, a ram. Okay, cool. And then, you know, you're trying for that environmental photo, right? So there's that ram up in the, the, the mountainside, you know, beautiful landscape. And then you want to get the rams, you know, button heads, killing each other off the side of the, the mountains <laughs> running and stuff. So there's that, the behavior aspect of it, right? So I know myself, that was a, a shift I wanted from, I went from the, the trophy kind of shots, you know, the head and shoulders, those nice portraits to the environmental side of things. And then it's like, for me now, it's always trying to capture that little decisive moment, right? But like you said, the only way you're going to learn to, to wait for it or anticipate it is by reading and learning about behavior, right? Natural history, right? So. Yeah. So no, that's that's a really good point. Um, a really good uh, good tip for everybody that that's listening. There, go out, learn all you can, because it's just going to make for better images for sure. Yeah, and I, I tell people too. There, they, you know, there's a lot of people, especially if you go out and you have to drop a couple grand for an R7 or you mm -hmm. get an R6 or whatever, and 100, 500. I mean, that's a lot of money for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe you can't afford a photo tour. Maybe you can't even afford to go on very many photo trips. Mm -hmm. I tell people, well, make sure you even just get out and, you know, don't get stuck in a rut and stuck in your job and sitting there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you live in the middle of the city of Calgary or city of Edmonton, there's so much wildlife just within the cities. It's even accessible from the bus routes and stuff, mm -hmm. and trains and so on. 100%. Um, you know, that just get out there and, you know, start with a squirrel. And yeah. You know what's coming along while you're busy photographing the squirrel, but even just working, you know, your controls and playing with stuff, you're then going to be ready when the bobcat walks out. And you're, oh, you're, yeah. you're doing all this different stuff. Yeah, oh, exactly. Hundred percent. I captured a, a great blue heron like forty feet from my backyard, right in the middle of Calgary. Right, and there's oh, white-faced awesome. ibises flying over, and you oh. never know what you're going to see. Just get out okay. there. Calgary is amazing for that. All yeah. the local parks and stuff. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, all the different species of owls. Eh? John, like, I mean, we've got pygmies yeah. and barred and 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 great greys and uh, great horned and. Um, or saw it's and I mean, this is all within Calgary or just outside of Calgary, yeah, like it's sure. insane, you know. I mean, so, really, we're we're pretty lucky. This is one of the best wildlife photography spots in North America, I think. Oh, oh you have yeah. everything because yeah. I go, I used to live in Strathmore, and then just even the, the amount of wildlife in the prairies, people don't understand, yeah. you know, uh, like it's just oh, it's insane. I mean, with again, with the snowies, all the different hawks, uh, the the, the short eared owls, you know, you got the pronghorn or slash antelope i'm not really sure what uh, they yeah. call it pronghorn here antelope pronghorn antelope yeah Prong, yeah pronghorn you know yeah. and all the mule deer and moose and stuff so that you're right like we're surrounded anywhere you go leaving calgary you're going to run into wildlife too so yeah. which is yeah. pretty cool there's not a lot of spots you can you can say that about yeah yeah we're very fortunate for that yeah. and then the same too right chris now now chris is a is, is a big um videographer so again with behavior right yeah i was gonna say the exact same thing i mean it, you know getting the the photos of the animals behavior the video for me is is key so i just want to get as much more video going forward i was going to ask you john you know yes you're you know you're out there shooting photos <clears throat> is the video more for you on the side of things more your story reels or, or have you are you capturing video as well at times or mostly focusing on fo photography i actually capture a lot of video um, okay. so in the patagonia puma trip to give you guys an, I, I took about thirty thousand photos and i have uh, about 250 video clips oh okay okay oh, good to know okay. so a substantial amount um yeah and most of it is used in exposed stuff right now 
Okay. Um, so I, I don't use much of it in my own reels and so on. Okay. I mm-hmm. sell a bit of it. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I've sold the nature of things, BBC, um, quite, quite a few British productions. Um, but by and large, most of it sits on my hard drives. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't have the time and manpower to do both, you yes. know, yeah. 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 The, the photos and then also the video. Yeah. Um, yeah. So mostly you see them in the exposed stuff nowadays. Sure. Yeah, fair enough. I remember yeah. reaching out to you, John, about that, the Instagram algorithm and stuff. And, you know, you had pretty much said like photos, I mean, video is the way to go, reels, shorts, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so that's why Chris and I have been shooting a lot more video and taking snippets from it because shooting yeah. in 4K, you can actually uh, do a vertical. Chris is teaching me all this, by the way. I have no <laughs> idea what I'm talking about, but you can do the verticals for You're the reels there. and the shorts and stuff uh, yeah. and that sort of thing because, um, uh, I mean, I'm I'm sure you've probably noticed it too. Like uh, the engagement oh, yeah. has, has dropped off, like just dropped right off. And it's funny, like the reels are getting tens of thousands of views, but a photo is getting like 200. So then this is with Instagram anyway. So mm-hmm. now it, it, that vi- big video shift. Um, Even the shorts on YouTube, right? The short, the reels are the same you know, content as the shorts, they can be used for both. And we're seeing even on our YouTube channel, the shorts seem to be bringing more subscribers in. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, w- I would think that'd be important to you, John, for your, um, your YouTube, your channel, your exposed, you know, conservative, uh, conservancy, um, even for, um, your workshops and, you know, that sort of thing, right? Like, yeah. You're- yeah and we've, uh, we actually just had an exposed <clears throat> meeting talking about upping our reels and story content, uh, yeah. For that purpose. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I for mean, sure. myself, I'm, I mean, I, I'm in a very fortunate position, I would say in that usually I don't really have to do any marketing to, mm-hmm. to sell my photo tours and things like that. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. I'm just lucky that I put it out there and people go, oh, I'm, 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 you know, yeah. It yeah. yeah. Very quickly. But I mean, I, that that's just, a, you know, I, I think a, a lot of good fortune over the years and and well john that's 20 up. years though that's 20 some years that's of you putting exactly. in the work I've been in a yeah. long time yeah so, you've yeah. been you put in the work people <laughs> know you um you know and and that's and and so that's not something that happened overnight yeah. it's it's yeah. two well, decades do, of work so i do get lazy on social media compared to many other pro mm-hmm. photographers um you know you'll see me take breaks for a week or two here and there and yeah sometimes i'll just schedule a whole bunch of stuff for like three weeks in a row and but it'll all be photos so oh you right. know what i this other <laughs> thing else. i wanted to bring up too is what i really appreciate what you did with uh your um your cougar and kittens and and the um uh the wolverine stories oh, is yeah. you waited what a month or two months right. after you found them and then you posted the whole series of stories is that right you waited yeah. at least a month right yeah Okay. That waited exactly a month. Yeah. Okay. So I thought that was, that was like yeah. ideal. I thought that was just absolutely perfect because yeah, then I, you don't have swarms of people going out there. You know, I mean, whether it was in Banff or whatever, people would have tried, I think, to to find or yeah, you know, maybe yeah. find them, put pressure on them, yeah. do something, right? So giving them a month like that um is pretty much giving them time to finish what they were doing and moving on right so yeah exactly so i i started that project was january 1st and that's when mm-hmm. i first started doing videos but i didn't release the first one until february 1st so that's that was, right yeah, that was genius. excellent yeah okay well and we should we should say like the goody wolves book right this wasn't like the last five years right this was no from... it was i waited a few years on purpose yeah, yeah. 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 Like I've, I've had a publisher in place since 2017 right but oh I Wow. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure the pack was actually gone yeah. mm-hmm. um, and has moved on. That's not to say there's not a pack that hasn't taken over down there. I, I sure. don't actually know right now. Um, yeah. But uh, um, there probably is. Uh, but yeah. the pack that I followed, I wanted to make sure they had, they were gone. They were, they, you know, it wasn't going to, my book wasn't going to cause a whole bunch of photographers to rush down there and put pressure on those same walls. hundred percent. hundred percent. So no, that, that was great. I just, I remember that with the reels because right. watch, yeah. watching them all the time and stuff. And you looked at the top and it was all these tiny little lines. There's like 30 of them all in the row. Right. You know, and just, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're scrolling through them and it's like realizing that it was a month later. So no, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. That was, that was well, a good way to go for sure. And, yeah. and truthfully, the Kootenai area doesn't need any more vehicles down there these days. No, with, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I was, well, Chris, what were you telling me about yeah, that? I was yeah. telling Joe yesterday. I mean, um, you know, we've we've I've been going out to the to the Kootenai, to the Columbia Valley, really in Vermeer Radium, mm-hmm. that area for thirty some odd years, and 
And I mean, the amount of people that have changed this, I was there this past long weekend and there was the most amount of people I've ever seen out there. Um, there's a, supposedly there's a cell tower out there that, that fits 8,000 people. And on the weekend, there's 60,000 people in that area and the amount of traffic. And now the detour from golden, when they're doing construction, I just always worry about the wildlife on that stretch of, of, of the highway through Kootenai. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, during that wolf project, I found you know, one year, my, my biggest year, I found seven dead moose. Oh, no way. That's crazy. Oh, wow. Think about that park and how narrow it is. Only 10 kilometers wide. I mean, seven dead moose is it? That's what Jeez. I found. Like, let alone who knows what else there was out there on days where I didn't make it out. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. geez. Eh? Wow. Yeah. Well, John, uh, we have, uh, we're going to ask you one last uh, question. What would you like to share or your words of advice or however you want to say it for, you know, people starting out? Like, so, you know, I, I just bought a camera. I just found a lens. You talked about behavior, but, um, and I guess you kind of mentioned it too, just to get out there and start shooting, right? Yeah. Follow your passion. Um, you know, getting out shooting in the backyard, any of that kind of stuff. But for me, it's always been, you know, when I see people like I, you know, I get people that come on, like for instance, my spirit bear trip, you know, and they, mm -hmm. some of these people have saved their whole life to be able to come on this trip. It's a super expensive trip. Mm -hmm. Nothing I can really do about that. Mm -hmm. We come out there and the first white bear comes walking out of the woods. And I've probably had a dozen people over the years just break into tears. They don't mm -hmm. even photograph. They just break into tears right away when this white bear comes walking out of the woods. And it's yeah. literally a spiritual moment for them. And mm -hmm. for me to get to watch that, you know, I see that passion then. Mm -hmm. There are times when my career where I've kind of, my passion has faded a little bit. And all I have to do is think back to moments like that. And it gets me all fired up again. And, and I start, you know, I, I think for people, if you're just starting out, follow your passion. If you want to go and photograph turkeys, go photograph turkeys. If you want to chase owls every single day, go chase owls. 100%. You know, just do whatever you, whatever makes your heart sing. Yeah. Uh, get out there and play with the cameras. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to save up and go on a cool trip, mm -hmm. totally do it. Like there's so many cool places you can go. It doesn't have to be with someone like me or Joe. It can be, mm -hmm. you know, go drive the Alaska highway. I mean, that's oh, a big for sure. Trip full of bison and grizzly bears and caribou and all kinds of stuff. You know, you have a hundred percent cool stuff. So much cool stuff you can go do. And uh, I just think, Anyone getting, it's a fantastic hobby. It's super mm -hmm. fun. Don't get into the professional side unless you're sure you want to be, to be a business. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's much different sitting at the computer doing accounting and marketing and so on. I love it. I think Joe likes it. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you, do you like that I side love of it? it? Yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. usually people that get in the professional side, love yeah. that side of it. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. So I always say to people, just follow your passion. If your passion is not the business side, don't try and make a professional. Yeah. Don't try and sell your images, you're just going to get disappointed down the line because you're not going to put the right amount of time or the right amount of effort or, mm -hmm. or you know, you're not going to follow quite the right path for that. So just stick to taking photos and having fun. That's right. Yeah, 100%. Good statement. Absolutely. Well, John, I really appreciate you coming on to, uh, tonight. It, this was uh, an eye opener for sure. We really appreciate you giving us the uh, the feedback on the R7. Yeah, for um, sure. Because we were following along on Instagram, you oh, know, yes. <laughs> well, with the with the Pumas and and uh, you know you mentioning you were shooting with it there. Um, really appreciate the advice, Chris. You have anything to add? No, I think you know we appreciate everything you you've done and joined joined our show. And uh, Chris, point to what's behind you there on the shelf. Yeah, you know I was you know. <laughs> there's John's a, there's books. a couple of john's books here well I, even you know even the first you know i just recently got this this past weekend and the first 40 pages i'm like i haven't even got to your stories yet i'm just absolutely enthralled <laughs> by this book photographing the wolves must be so different than anything else so just yeah, everybody yeah. get that book and read it so yeah yeah, yeah. yes so uh, everyone we're gonna add links uh, to the bottom we're gonna Add links to John's books, uh, John's workshops. Uh, John also sells prints and cards. And we'll uh, leave a link to his uh, Conservancy, uh, his YouTube uh, channel. So I think we'll Thank leave it for that. Thank you for having me on, guys. It's a real honor to be part of the podcast. Oh, hey, John. It was a pleasure. It was all ours. Absolutely. Was so all ours. Uh, we're going to leave it at that, guys. And we'll catch you uh, next time on the Nature Photo Guys podcast. Thanks for watching. See ya. Thanks for joining us on the Nature Photo Guys podcast. If you have any questions, contact us at info at thenaturephotoguys.ca or message us on Facebook and Instagram at The Nature Photo Guys Podcast. Visit YouTube and subscribe to our channel to watch all our latest videos. 
or follow and listen to our latest podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on our website at thenaturephotoguys.ca. We'll catch you next time on the Nature Photo Guys podcast. <laughs>